Um, my name is Brian Parks. I'm the CEO of Jam Factory, and uh, pleased to see so many of you here today. Um, let me start, as always, and, and importantly, by acknowledging that we're here on Ghana land and acknowledge elders past, present, and emerging, and uh, that this land was never seen. Let me also thank the University of South Australia for the fabulous ongoing partnership we have on many, many levels, but most of all today for allowing us to use this space for our weekly talk series. Uh, and it's such a nice venue for, for a sense of intimacy and uh, connection with the speaker. Today, um, we continue the Festival of Clay series that, uh, that we've been, been having and, and some great speakers so far. Today, um, unashamedly, I will say my favourite, <laughs> uh, unashamedly, um, because of my own personal aesthetic sensibilities, Kirsten Quiller was one of my favourite artists who stop, let alone in the distracted profession. Kirsten's had a long association with Jam Factory, um, and because we're studying late, I'm not going to do any more introduction than that because we want to hear from you, not me. <laughs> Now, can, uh, can you hear me okay if I speak into that? Great. I wasn't ready for the karaoke um, <laughs> situation. Um, thank you so much, Brian. Um, I'm quite overwhelmed by that introduction. Um, and thank you, all of you, for coming today. There's so many um, peers and people I admire and students and people I've worked with and colleagues and friends. It's really, really lovely uh, to see you all here and I feel very lucky that you've all come. Hopefully, um, yeah, you won't be BBB, bored beyond belief. <laughs> um, so um, I'm starting today with, this is, I just was saying to some friends before, I think I get the prize for the weirdest pottery object ever made in ceramics. This was something that I made in my last year of art school, 1988. And, um, when I was there, there was a lot of experimentation with this stuff called cement fondue, uh, which, and I had started art school with this big idea that I was going to, my career was going to be making furniture out of clay. Absolutely ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> totally, totally ridiculous. Anyway, and that's why I've ended up with this kind of pretty ridiculous looking ceramic piece. Um, but in my defence, um, it was the 1980s and you know, uh, Memphis design was huge. Um, Etor Sostas was huge. Um, bright colours, um, you know, angular design, multi-patterned um, objects, uh, bright, effervescent. You know, that was what was around us at that at that time. Um, and weirdly. In uh, 2009, I was at a fair and I saw this object, which was um, glass, a really thick piece of sort of, it looked like frozen molten glass. And it had all these like colored rods stuck in it and things oozing out. And that was made by Etor Sostas, age 92 or something. It was an absolutely incredible object. And I thought, wow. That is an artist who's always reinventing, always thinking. I think he's sadly died now. Um, so anyway, yeah, I just want to set the scene, 1988. Um, but at the same time, when I was at university, we were experimenting a lot with colour and decoration and creating narrative uh, to put onto your ceramic surfaces. Um, and it was kind of, I guess, not a backlash, but a reaction, reaction to, I guess, a more traditional idea of what studio ceramics, you know, had been. Um, and this is a piece by uh, Marc Chagall. But, you know, we were also looking at works by Picasso, uh, you know, a number of ceramic artists who had, you know, started out, you know, or not started out, but also incorporated this kind of way of working into their practice. Um, one of the artists working when I was at art school, who was a couple of years above me, was Peter Johnson, fabulous South Australian ceramic artist, as was John Ollinger. He was a few years above me and Joe Crawford as well. Um, and, of course, the famous Jerry Wedd. And Jerry, you know, of course, has had a huge influence on ceramics in Australia. Um, but he also had a huge influence on all of us at art school at that time. 
Um, and Stephen Benwell, who was, you know, is still making amazing, fabulous work in Victoria, um, but this is his work from, from that period. So this is the kind of things that, you know, were around me in that time. And this is the kind of work that I, you know, went from the stupid cement furniture, which fell apart and really was hopeless, and then started to think, okay, I actually really need to find a way. If I'm going to work in ceramics, I need to find a way that I'm going to earn money from this. So I started to develop my throwing skills and my painting skills and um, develop this range of work, uh, which I made for many years. Um, I moved to the UK in 1990 and um, I was really lucky I got a studio in um, Clapham in a kind of like a public access centre. It was a swimming pool, which was amazing, um, but it also had these fabulous workshops. So I could make my work during the week and I sold it in markets on the weekend. And I did that for quite a few years. And it was really an amazing way of building skill. Uh, you know, there's all that whole idea of the 10,000 hours and, you know, making a lot of things. And I think sometimes you just have to make a lot of things and you don't love all the things you make. And I know in this day and age of, um, you know, re limited resources and not wasting, but I think at the same time to, to build an understanding of material, you also have to make a lot of things. Um, anyway... When I was living in there, I moved to the UK and I lived there for eight years. And um, one of my favourite objects that I saw in the UK, which this is in, was in the Jeffia Museum. This is from the 16th century. And it's just a wonderfully sculptural object. It's a watering can, not for your garden, but to keep the dust down on your floor in your house. <laughs> so I think I'll probably need that now in my house. Um, in the UK, there's another fabulous collection of ceramics, which now is housed in the British Museum, and some of you may have seen it. It's called the Percival David Collection of Chinese Ceramics. Um, I mean, probably now there would be questions, I think, about the ethics of someone having all this ceramics as one collection, but it was the most astounding collection of Chinese ceramics. Um, this moon jar belonged to Bernard Leach and he gave it to Lucy Ree um, and it's also in the British Museum. And of course, Hamada, uh, Shoji Hamada teapot. Um, and I'm like, I'm showing you these images because I was living in England. I was making this 1980s bright coloured work uh, in through to the 90s. But what was happening around me, what, what I was seeing around me was a very different kind of work. And I began to become strongly influenced and drawn to that type of work. You know, a type of work that speaks more about the materiality and the, of, of clay and the expressivity of clay. Um, and taking, I guess, taking away the narrative expressed through painting it on an object, but creating a different type of narrative through material. Um, and during my time there and for many years afterwards, I would visit sometimes this potter who's called Richard Batterham, who very sadly just died last year. Um, Richard Batterham had studied at the Leach Pottery in the 1950s and pretty much dedicated his whole life to making the same objects. And... I recently read a fantastic essay by um, an amazing writer on craft called Tanya Harrod, and she talked about um, the originality that can come through repetition. And, you know, for those of us that are involved in making and making a lot of things, this idea of repetition, it's, you know, you're not just making the same thing over and over again. There's something different that happens all the time. And I think, you know, Richard, when you look at Richard Batram's work, you can see that so clearly. Um, I have a lot of his work at home, <laughs> I have to say. Um, and of course, Lucy Ree, I was very fortunate to go to a very big retrospective of her work that was in the Barbican uh, at, in London. And, um, you know, her work has always been a huge influence on my practice. Um, and then, you know, coming back to Australia, 
In the NGV, there's an amazing collection of Chinese ceramics, which is called the Kent Collection. Um, and I saw this bowl, which is a dingware um, bowl, and I just thought, oh, you know, how do you how do you make that? Like, is that metal around the rim? What what's going on with that? There was just this incredible sort of expressivity in that bowl for me, and then I was really drawn in. I mean, first of all, I just wanted to emulate it. But then I wanted to do something different because I wanted to talk about where I am, where I'm from, my, my surroundings. I didn't want to just copy a Chinese bowl. Um, but somehow I wanted yeah, to create a sort of nexus between these two worlds. Um, so I was really lucky in 1999, I started working in the jam factory. Um, and I started at the same time as Vipu Srivlasa, which I'm sure many of you know. Um, and Vipu and I had little studio spaces next to each other and really supported each other quite a lot. Um, but also at the same time, Stephen Bowers was the head of ceramics and Philip Hart was working here, there as well, and uh, lots of different artists. And it was, it was an amazing time. And I felt so lucky to have that learning um, and camaraderie and collegiate environment, but also the peer level mentoring, uh, which is just so critical when you're trying to, when you're learning new, new ideas and new techniques. Um, you know, afterwards when I was still there, Neville Asad Saha was there as a studio head and amazing as well. You know, it's just fabulous energy and so much knowledge that was given to all of us. And Philip as well and Steph, you know, just, yeah, fabulous. So anyway, I knew when I was in England that I wanted to change my work. I wanted to work with these new materials. I wanted to um, develop a way of, you know, creating expression through glaze and using porcelain. Um, so yeah, this is Stephen Bauer's work. Um, you know, he was just such a phenomenal um, director and support, and he's always been a, such an amazing support to me. Um, and this is, so these images of my work are the things that I was making when I was in the jam factory. Uh, and then in 2004, I, um, actually no, it's probably a bit earlier, I took, undertook a master's degree, master's by research here at the University of South Australia. And, and that was a really fantastic experience. It was hard, very hard, because I hadn't been at art school for a long time and I was very, very bad at writing, still am. But, uh, and so I found that very challenging. But I really loved the research process and I really loved the way the research process makes you think about your work in new and different ways and discoveries, you know, and, you know, you read one article about something and that leads on to something else and you read the bibliography and then, you know, you're just madly talking about these journals and things. Um, but anyway, it, it just, this is um, an artwork by Gabrielle Orozco, who's a Mexican artist and, um, Lucio Fontana um, from 1968. When I first saw these, I didn't realise they were from 1968. You know, I probably, you know, saw them first 20 years ago. I thought they were the most contemporary object I'd ever seen, but, you know, they were from 1968. Um, and, of course, Japanese ceramics has always played a huge influence, and this is from the Momoyama period in Japan. Um, so, again, you know, I started... As I was saying before, I really wanted to be able to articulate what was in my environment uh, rather than just repeat, you know, replicating something from somewhere else. And I became really interested in this kind of idea of urban decay, architectural decay, um, which I'm still really interested in now. You know, my work feeds through to this idea of the ruin. And I think, you know, with these kind of um, uh, surfaces that we see everywhere in Australia, you know, this. It's so abstracted, but it's got so much power as well. And I, you know, I felt like it, with this, this is Lisa Farrant's rainwater tank, by the way, from Beverly. Um, but just that idea of what's inside coming out onto the surface. Um, and so these are some of the works, you know, that I made uh, during my masters. And then this is sort of moving fast forward, sort of towards up to two thousand and ten. Um, 
And I was lucky to have an Australia Council residency in England. Um, and, you know, that how lucky is that to visit all these different collections? But one of the best places I've ever, ever been to is a place called Kettle's Yard in Cambridge. I don't know if any of you have ever been there. If you haven't, you've, you have to go there. Um, it was set up by a man called Jim Edies, who used to work at Tate Britain uh, in the 1930s. Uh, in fact, I was just reading about him on the weekend. He's quite an eccentric, but a, but a person with an amazing vision. And, you know, as so often happens in history, a person with amazing vision doesn't get listened to at the time, but afterwards we all go, oh, what an amazing person. But he set up this place, collected all this art, and then lent it to the students at Cambridge to put in their dormitories and rooms, you know, mirrors and, all, you know, all kinds of amazing things. Um, so this is, um, you know, Lucy Ree um, pottery. Um, and I think, you know, for all of you, all of us, we could all say we've had uh, people in our lives who've had huge impact. And of course, there's our colleagues and our peers and mentors. But um, these two women, uh, Gwyn Hanson Piggott and Gwen Leach, Gwen Leach Harris, they were friends. Um, and Gwen was a painter, and Gwen, of course, you know, the most amazing ceramic artist. Um, and through Gwen, I met Gwen. <laughs> um, and, you know, I remember before I, I was going to go and stay at Gwen's house, and Gwen said to me, Well, you might. You know, you might rub each other up the wrong way, <laughs> but it'll be okay. And and it, you know, it was it was it it was fine. But Gwen just had this lovely way of, you know, suggesting things. But she was an absolutely fabulous artist and an and a champion of ceramics, and of potters. And she, Gwen, had lived in St Ives in the 1950s and worked at the Leach Pottery selling pots. So she knew so much history. She was, you know, just the oral history she had was re really incredible. Um, the other person, <laughs> such a funny but the really tall big person and the, <laughs> the smaller people. Uh, the other person that, you know, has just had a huge, huge impact on my life is Kai Lu, the designer Kai Lu. Um, and this was an exhibition I had in Sydney and Kai came to open it and Gwyn turned up by surprise and it was just, you know, an amazing moment for anybody. Um, for me it was very, very special. Um, this is Sunflower Chair by Kai Lu. I've sat in that chair, it's just so beautiful. And of course Gwyn Hanson figure. Um, so yeah, I just was, you know, continuing on, wanting to sort of find this idea of ha forming a juncture between something very formal and something very abstract using only, only you know, materials. Um, all my work is gas-fired, um, you know, using different, a lot of different porcelains these days. Um, and then increasingly I became more interested, you know, in, you know, I guess the idea that was kind of around me a lot at the time, you know, including with Gwen Hanson Piggott, the idea of your work being placed in groups and, and what, what does that mean? What, what are you doing when you're putting your work in groups? Um, and I absolutely have always loved this artist. This is um, an English artist who lives in New York called Andrew Lord. And, you know, these works are from 20, 20 years ago probably. Um, and then, you know, just looking at the way vessels have been grouped together in history. Um, I don't know if any of you, many of you are familiar with these particular set of photographs. These are by the artist Cy Twombly, who, um, you know, an amazing abstract painter, one of my most favourite painters. But this series of still life photos are just so powerful in their simplicity. And they really made me think a lot about you know, telling the story of rudimentary, with rudimentary objects, you know, that you're telling, you're creating a different type of narrative through basic objects, the objects we all have in our homes, the glass bottles, the, the, the glass you just used this morning, you know, to have your toothbrush in. Um, so then I started to, you know, think about how the objects would interrelate and create a different type of story. So the story's not painted onto the work, but the work 
collected together is creating a story. Uh, this is the painter, painter Chardin. I started to really look a lot more at painting as the kind of reference point for my work. Um, I've got no idea how I'm going for time. Am I like halfway or? Okay. <laughs> um, this is a sculpture by Cy Twombly. Um, as I said, you know, he's probably one of my favorite artists. And I think, um, you know, because I'm, you know, yes, I'm trying to make this sort of refined porcelain object, but I also want there to be some kind of element of something else occurring in my work. I don't want it just to be about something that can look almost like it was made by a machine. I want it to feel, be like it's made by hand and that there's an expression that comes from, I know I keep saying, but the, the materials. And, you know, a painter like Cy Twombly, that's exactly what they're doing, this incredible, powerful expression that's from pure use of paint. Um, so then, you know, I started to sort of play around more with this, you know, trying to run, get things to run down the pot. Um, in 2011, I was very fortunate to be included in um, a collaboration with Kai Lu, which was called Collectors. And uh, Julie Blyfield, who's here today, was part of that. And Jess Lachlan and um, Bruce Nusky. This is Julie's collaboration with Kai Lu. Um, and Bruce Nusky, uh, Prue Venables also, and Gwyn Hanson Piggott. And this is Jess, Jess's. Um, and the whole collection was acquired by the Art Gallery of South Australia. Um, later, I was invited to be part of a sort of history project by Vivon Thwaite, a curator, and there was an exhibition at the AF where we could access information from the Architecture Museum and then make a work in response to it. And I just, I think it's when I started to become really interested in Australian history and the objects that are derived from Australian domestic history. And I've, I borrowed these shards from the museum and had them photographed by Grant Hancock and had them blown up. So the shards were sort of this big. Um, in, in retrospect, I wish I'd had it much bigger because I really wanted the feeling of the, the, the sort of contradiction that this is a, um, a domestic object that's been brought from England with this sort of bucolic scene on it, yet probably a lot of people were um, enduring real hardship, you know, in a tent on the bank of the banks of the Torrens in a completely opposite experience to what is depicted. Um, so, yeah, and this encyclopedia was really amazing. It just had everything in it from how to build a pig pen, how to, be a, how to build a chair, how to build a stone cottage. It was a really remarkable um, book that's in the um, UniSA Architecture Museum. Um, in the, about the same year, um, Wendy Walker curated um, a beautiful exhibition that was held in the Jam Battery called Imagining Interiors. And um, it's sort of where I kind of really started, again, to come back to this idea of painting and the way that painting can inform your work and, you know, the history of painting. And this is beautiful painting by Wilhelm Hammershoy. Um, and this is a work I made in collaboration with Sarah Waters. Um, that um, sort of napkin has these most amazing tiny little flies embroidered on there by Sarah. Um, okay, this is my brother at Sovereign Hill. Now, I don't know if any of you have been to Sovereign Hill or did you go there as a child, um, but it's a crazy kind of place. <laughs> but it's sort of a great place. It's a, you know, it's a living museum. And my brother and I went there as we, when we were kids. And I think it just always really stayed with me. So I went back there as an adult. And it was, it was a place where I really began to think about how, you know, objects brought from overseas or from exile or from immigration end up next to objects that are made here and they tell a different kind of story, you know. So, I mean, yeah, there would be these objects. And so this is inside, like, you know, this is a mock makeup. This is inside a tent in Sovereign Hill. But there's these kind of Chinese objects and then there's these metal objects. And, and I just thought it's actually the objects that tell the story of history. 
Um, and in fact, Brian, I remember you years ago saying to me that they are the trace elements of our lives, you know, exactly those words. And I just, that really stayed with me. And I, I think so much of my work from this moment has been about that, about how, what's left behind when we're not here anymore and what's left behind from all the people that have been here before. And what you see in a museum, does that really tell the right, st the whole story? And, and then what you see in your house, you might have an heirloom from, you know, grandparent next to something you bought in the jam factory last week, you know, so, and I think that creates a really interesting story in itself. Um, so in 2012, I was very fortunate to be awarded the Sydney Meyer Award, and I kind of used those ideas as um, the kind of background for, the, for that exhibition. And again, um, very lucky to have Kai Lu help with the, um, the furniture here. <laughs> uh, in 2014, um, from Art South Australia, I received Bank of Tokyo um, scholarship fund to research kiln sites in Japan, which again was a very, very lucky and very phenomenal and very life-changing experience in terms of my practice. Um, I mean, in Japan, I'm sure many of you have been there, there's just exquisite detail everywhere. And I just even thought, like, this this is graffiti. It's like Ikebana graffiti. <laughs> um, and many of you would have come to a talk of, oh, actually late last year with uh, Kenji Urenishi. Um, was, Kenji and I worked together in this, um, they don't really say factory, they, it's called a kiln, but it's in uh, Arita. Uh, this particular place is 400 years old. They've been making porcelain objects for 400 years. And, um, but an economic downturn meant that it was quite empty really, except for it was just full of all these boxes of ceramics. And Kenji and I would be there at night running around like little mice, <laughs> looking in all these boxes. And I mean, Kenji made ama amazing, amazing things. I think I was a bit sort of awestruck by it all, so I didn't really come up with anything good, but um, the experience was incredible. Kenji told me this woman and that ad, if anyone's been Japanese here, you can tell me the truth because he said that's an ad for a private eye, but I don't believe him. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, just continuing on that kind of interest into objects sitting together and still life, um, this is the Australian painter Jude Ray. Um, and I think Jude Ray is, is so brilliant at bringing together incongruous objects um, to create this really powerful imagery. Um, Mirandi, of course, many of you would be familiar with. Um, these are some of his objects. Um, and then these are from exhibition in 215 and 216. Um, and then I was able to do a residency in the Margaret Ollie Centre, which I know Claire um, has just been and done that. And uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wonderful opportunity if any of you, you know, think to apply to do that. It's absolutely amazing. So you can stay in a kind of artist's apartment and you can either, you know, research the objects that belong to Margaret Ollie or the landscape or, you know, um, other things in and around the museum. I spent a lot of time in this recreation. So at the Tweed Regional Gallery, they have completely recreated Margaret Ollie's studio. 20,000 objects moved from her studio, placed exactly where they were in her studio, but in the Tweed Regional Gallery. And I was able to just be in there and sit with these objects. It was a very emotional experience, actually. I mean, I never knew Margaret Ollie, but it kind of reminded me of being in my mum's house or something, you know, there's yeah, some kind of emotional attachment. So I, you know, would got to sort of look at objects and pull them out and place them together and think about relationships. And again, this idea of incongruity and, and history. Um, I mean, that, oh, excuse me, that Skyfus cup there, which is a remake of a Skyfus cup, um, you know, I mean, that's Greek, 300 BC you know, next to a glass bottle that's dug out of, you know, Victorian era garden. 
Um, yeah, anyway, these are some of the works that came from that. One of the outcomes of that residency is that the Tweed Regional Gallery offers you an exhibition um, in their gallery space. Um, and, you know, it's really wonderful if you have that chance to work with a public gallery, um, you know, like Jam Factory, like the Tweed Regional Gallery, Newcastle Gallery, these public museums, they are so supportive and allow you to think of your work in new ways um, and broaden your ideas outside of, you know, sometimes a commercial context. Um, so in 2018, um, Erica Green invited me to be part of um, the Adelaide Biennial of Australian Art and I exhibited my work in the Jam Factory and um, I would have to say it's probably my most ambitious project, um, but it was a, an absolutely phenomenal experience to see your work in this environment with, with all the support that comes and, and all the curatorial support that came from Erica and the Jam Factory support that came from Brian and, and Margaret Hancock. And, um, you know, I ended up making 73 pieces that were displayed along this 14 metre plinth. Um, and a couple of years prior to this, there'd been a moment where I'd been at the photographer Grant Hancock's and I, we were in the dark and I saw a shaft of light come through the door and just hit uh, my work. And I thought, oh, it would be amazing one day to be able to just like have an exhibition in the dark <laughs> with, with some just some light. And I thought, oh, that's a bit mad probably. But, um, and then in the interim, I saw an incredible work by um, a, a Queensland um, Indigenous artist. I think he calls himself D now, but I, I, Dale Harding is who I'm thinking of. Um, and he had created a sort of mock colonial hut. Um, and you walk inside of it and you can't see anything when you walk inside. And it's only as your eyes adjust that you see the edge of a steel bed or the edge of a chest of drawers. Um, and it really taught me so much about the power of light and, and how evocative it is. Um, and that sense of theatre and, I, you know, that artwork just had so much power and so much drama. Um, it's, all, it's always really stayed with me, I mean, in terms of, you know, colonial history and, yeah, he's a very incredible artist. Um, in 2019, um, I was really, really, I mean, I feel like I keep saying I'm really lucky, but I have been just so lucky, just so, so lucky. And I got this fellowship from Arts Australia to travel to look at collections in Greece and Italy um, and to talk, you know, I think, you know, going back to the beginning of the talk even in a way, to kind of expand on this idea of the ruin, um, of things in disarray, of things in chaos. And this was sort of going back to the, to the original ruin in a sense. Um, it was, yeah, incredibly profound to go to these places like Pompeii and Herculaneum and the Acropolis, um, places I'd never imagined I would ever go to. Um, but they really, um, you know, that history uh, just had an enormous um, pull and uh, intrigue. And, and again, looking at the way museums install objects and are they out of context? Um, but then, again, working with Erica Green and Samstag Museum, I was um, fortunate to be able to develop a body of work called Ithaca, um, which was based on Homer's Odyssey. Um, Ithaca was the home of uh, Odysseus, and, you know, it takes him many years to get back to Ithaca from the Trojan Wars, and his wife Penelope is waiting for him. And I just wanted... I wanted if this were Ithaca to look like this sort of unattainable city um, because I feel like sometimes when you leave home and if you've been away from your home for a few years and then you go back, it's not the same. You, you can't, and you're not the same. 
but it sort of feels like it should be the same. So there's this kind of like grasping at something, but it's a bit elusive. And that's kind of what I wanted um, to sort of convey with this work. And um, Erica and Joanna Kito and the staff at the Sam Stag Museum were so supportive and help, helped and Tobias um, Stelly made this amazing plinth, which was then covered in Venetian plaster because uh, we wanted to create this kind of like idea of a cliff face um, from afar that's kind of impossible to, um, uh, you know, climb and attain. Um, so more recently, I mean, I guess still continuing on from that idea of the ruin um, and kind of that idea of Greek history and the Aegean and I started to, with the help of Susan Frost, um, think about, you know, trying to incorporate this blue glaze and um, Susan, who's a fabulous ceramic artist, but also knows so much about glaze technology, as does Peter Anderson, um, developed this beautiful matte blue, um, which she's very kindly allowed me to use in my work. <laughs> so um, last year I made some of these pieces and um, I wanted to create this idea of like the wrong shadow, like if um, like the blue was the, the blue, it was the shadow, but the, they're not reflecting what's in front. They're, you know, they're completely different objects. Um, so that's an idea that I'm still kind of working with. Um, and I'm just coming like more to the present now. I've got an exhibition coming up in a couple of months. And for the first time, I'm going to start working, I'm going to incorporate some terracotta objects. And I'm quite excited about that. I, what's not to love with terracotta? Um, and I've just done some terracotta throwing at Peter Johnson's studio. Um, but, you know, again, looking back at painting and, you know, this, this you know, collection of objects there. Um, and this one, this painting is uh, Francisco de Zubaran. Um, yeah, I think it's like. 1629. Um, and then just to finish up, these are some photos from my studio. Um, I mean, yeah, pottery. This is this. Okay, I'm, I started the talk on the weirdest object in Israel, and I'm finishing the talk on the weirdest object in Israel. <laughs> I just tried to glaze this thing this morning. Really stressful. <laughs> Um, this is my gas kiln at home. Um, glaze testing, you know, don't do often enough. And I'm very fortunate that I've had Susan helping me. And Susan helps me also load my kiln and takes away so much anxiety that uh, <laughs> she probably needs about eight glasses of wine when she gets home. Um, this is, of course, Susan's beautiful work. Um, and just finishing off, I just went to Korea uh, earlier this year. And Korea is a country that gives one room to one pot. And that, I think, speaks to all our hearts. Um, so I'll just end there. <laughs> Thank you.